This two-hour block of Revised Wise programmes is about science. It covers getting started, interpreting results, living things, humans and other animals, green plants, materials and their properties, solids, liquids and gases. The starting time of each programme is shown in the menu, so they can be found using the clock in the top right-hand corner of the screen. First, getting started. I'm here to help our puzzling pupil and you to make the most of what you know when you come to do your Key Stage 2 science tests. In each of these programmes, as well as in our books, audio tapes and on the internet, we'll be looking at all the bits of science that you might find tricky. So, what's the problem? It's my science paper and I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. So what happens when you come to do your Key Stage 2 science tests in May? During the week of the tests, you'll have two science tests, paper A and paper B. Each paper is taken on a different day, and each one lasts 35 minutes. In each paper, questions on the different parts of science are all mixed up, so you could have a question about plants, followed by a question about forces, and then another question about plants. And how many do I have to get right? Well, you need to get just over half the marks right to get a level four. And that's the standard which everyone hopes you'll get at the end of primary school. Now let's have a look at the different kinds of questions you might be asked. Which two of the following can children catch from other people? Tick two boxes. Chicken pox, flu, toothache, broken arm. So what do I do here? When questions like this, you just tick boxes with the right answers by them. OK, I can do that. It's chicken pox and flu. And it tells you here that you get one mark for that. Now, some questions need a one-word answer. A teacher put a thermometer into the water. Use one word to complete this sentence. The thermometer measures the of the water in degrees Celsius. All I know I can do this is temperature. And remember, you don't lose marks for spelling in the science test. In other questions, you have to write a whole sentence. The children measured the length of a stick shadow at different times on a day in summer. At nine o'clock in the morning, the sun is shining. Explain how the shadow of the stick is formed. All I know, the stick blocks the light. Okay, so that's what you write down. The stick blocks the light from the sun. One thing that's important when you do your test is to read the question carefully and answer only what you're asked. This might sound obvious, but let's look at an example. This question has a picture of someone feeling their pulse. Oh, I know this. We measured our pulse in class when we learned about the heart, so the heart pops the blood around the body. Now, what did I just say? That I should read the question carefully. Exactly. Now, look at what the question actually asked. What is pulse rate a measure of? So you don't have to say how the heart works, but what the pulse rate measures. So what should the answer be? That the pulse rate measures a person's heart rate. That's right. A golden rule for answering science questions is to keep them precise and scientific. What do you mean by scientific? Well, by scientific, I mean that you have to answer the question by thinking about the science behind the question. Now, try that one. Explain why it is important for seeds to be dispersed from the parent plant. 
So what sort of things do you need to think about to answer this why question well? Well, how about these? What is the question about? The question is about seeds and their dispersal. What do seeds do? Seeds grow into new plants. What helps new plants grow? Having enough water, nutrients and sunlight helps new plants grow. The key scientific point here is that seeds grow into new plants and plants grow using water, light, air and nutrients from the soil. If the seeds start growing right under the parent plant, they risk never getting enough light or water. They will grow better if they don't have to compete with their parent plant for those things. So having thought about the science behind the question, you must give an answer that says something about what a plant needs to grow. And that explains why it's important for the seeds to be dispersed away from the parent plant. Have a look at these answers and see if you can spot those that got a mark and those that didn't. Because there has to be different types of plants growing everywhere. So they can get enough nutrients and space to grow, which they won't get if they were too near the parent plant. Because the plant has to grow bigger. So that they get enough water and sunlight and don't have to compete against their parent plant. Only two of those answers were marked right. Did you spot them? They were this one. So they have enough nutrients and space to grow, which they won't get if they're too near the parent plant. And I know so that they get enough water and sunlight and they don't have to compete with the parent plant. That's right, because those were the only ones that were precise and scientific. So you've got to remember to give answers that are precise and scientific. Remember to read the question carefully and answer what is asked. Take your time to think about questions that ask why. And you have to use the proper scientific words. <laughs> Using proper scientific words helps you answer the question accurately. Using other words can sometimes make you lose marks. Look at this, for example. There was a puddle in the playground. During the morning, the puddle became smaller. No water soaked into the playground. Explain what happened to the water. Well, it just disappeared. By using the word disappeared, you're not really explaining what happened. It's not really a very precise word. We usually use it when we can't see something anymore. What actually happened was that the liquid water became water vapour. That's water in the form of a gas and went into the air. But isn't there an easier way of saying that? When a liquid turns into a gas, we can say that the liquid has... Evaporated. That's right. That's exactly the right word. It's the short, precise and scientific answer, and you get all the marks for it. Using the right word is very important in science. It's the only way to describe exactly what is happening. There are lots of questions in the science tests about investigations or experiments done by children. Often the results are shown in tables like this, or bar graphs like this, or line graphs like this. A lot of questions ask you to work things out from tables, bar graphs, and line graphs, so you need to know how they work. Let's look at this question here, which asks you to read results from a table. Some children carried out two fair tests on three different fabrics, A, B, and C. First, they hung a 100 gram mass from the bottom of each fabric. Secondly, they soaked each fabric in water. The table shows the results of their two tests. Right, let's have a look at the questions which went along with this table. Some children wanted a fabric which doesn't stretch. Which fabric should they choose? Tick one box, A, B, C. This question is about stretching, so I need to look along the row of stretching. Yep. And we want to find a fabric which does not stretch. Yeah. Hmm. Here it is, fabric A. The next way of presenting results is the bar graph. Let's watch some pupils making a bar graph using this table. First, the axis.
to represent the heading on the horizontal axis, here the type of can. Then the columns. Making sure that they're the right height. And here it is. It's important to check the scale on any graph before you answer questions. See how on this scale the numbers go up in 50s? But in this one, the numbers go up in 1s. Now, what question went with this bar graph? What was the reading on the force meter when the cup was hung from it? 4 newtons. Another way of presenting results is on a line graph. Watch this. It shows you how to draw a line graph from a table of results. In this table are the results of an experiment. Some children ran honey on a tilted tray and measured the time it took to run 10 centimetres at different temperatures. So what the children changed is the temperature of the honey, and what they measured is the time in seconds for the honey to run the 10 centimetres. In a graph, we usually put what we change on the horizontal axis and what we measure on the vertical axis. Now, the first thing to do is to transfer the headings from the table to the graph. Next, we need to put the scale on the horizontal axis. It needs to go up to 60. Then we need to do the scale for the vertical axis. Here the biggest measurement they made was 120 seconds, so we have to make sure that we go up to 120. Now it's time to plot the points. So first, when the honey was 5 degrees Celsius, it took 120 seconds. When it was 15 degrees Celsius, it took 80 seconds. When the honey was 40 degrees Celsius, it took 20 seconds. And when the honey was 60 degrees Celsius, it took 10 seconds. And that's it. We join all the crosses and we've got a graph. If you've already got a graph, you can do the process in reverse and find out information from it, like this. How long does it take the honey at 40 degrees Celsius to run 10 centimetres? So that's 20 seconds. Often you get test questions asking you to work out something using information on a table, a bar graph or a line graph. It's a good idea to look at the pattern in the results and try to work out the story the graph is telling you. Look at this question about ice and water. Amy puts some ice in a jar of water and stirs. She measures the temperature of the water with a thermometer every 20 minutes. Her results are shown on this graph. Let's look for the pattern in this line graph. To start off with, the line goes down. That means the temperature of the water is going down as time goes on. Why? Because of the ice that's been put in it. After a while, the line starts to go back up. The temperature of the water is going up. It's getting warmer. Then the line flattens off. So what does that mean? That means that it's staying at the same temperature. You're right. The water is now at the same temperature as the room. Now, the question on the paper is at which point, A, B, C or D, will there still be ice left in the glass? Well, I know the ice is colder than water. The ice in the glass will make the water colder. So I must look for a place where the line is going down. Have you got one? Ah, point A. I'll put a tick in the box. Well, that's the end of our unit about getting started on the science test. So let's check what we've done. We looked at the different kinds of questions in the papers. We saw how important it is to use precise and scientific words. 
and we looked at making sense of tables and graphs. You and your teacher can go over these things at school and don't forget you can always wind the tape back and look at bits of the program again. There are also our books, audio tapes and interactive Revise Wise website to help you prepare for your test. So we'll let you get on with your test and let you get on with your revision. The next programme is about interpreting results. In these programmes and in our books, audio tapes and on the internet, we're helping you with the things you might find tricky in your Key Stage 2 science tests. This time it's interpreting results. Here's a question with a table of results. Jill made circuits with different lengths of wire, the same battery and the same bulb. The wire is coated in plastic. She recorded her results in a table. Here's a table. Length of wire, 40 metres, no light, 30 metres, dim glow, 20 metres, faint light, 10 metres, bright light, and 1 metre, very bright light. Describe how changing the length of the wire in the circuit affects the brightness of the light. What does the word effects mean, and how do they want me to describe it? This is all about describing the relationship between one thing and another. Because a lot of scientific investigations are about the relationships between things, a lot of questions in the test will ask you to describe the relationship between two things. But I don't know about describing relationships. Yes, you do. You do it all the time. You just don't realise that you're doing it. There are a lot of everyday situations when you describe relationships without noticing it. Let's have a look. There are a lot of children in the playground now. Yes, it's getting noisier. The more children in the playground, the louder the noise. Did you hear what she said? The more children in the playground, the louder the noise. She's just described how the number of children affects the volume of sound. She's just described a relationship. She spotted the relationship between two things, the number of children and the volume of sound. But the other two children didn't describe a relationship because they only mentioned one factor and not the relationship between them. The first child talked only about the number of children. There are a lot of children in the playground now. When the second one talked only about the noise. Yes, it's getting noisier. Only the last child described the relationship between the number of children and the noise. The more children in the playground, the louder the noise. Let's see another example. Oh no, there's loads of people in front of us in the queue. Yeah, it's going to take ages till we get our food. Yes, the more people in front of us in the queue, the longer we wait. This last pupil has also described a relationship between two things. Yes, the more people in front of us in the queue, the longer we wait. She described how the length of time you wait depends on the number of people in front of you in the queue. She spotted another relationship between two things. The first and second children didn't describe the relationship between the length of the queue in front of you and the time you have to wait. Oh no, there's loads of people in front of us in the queue. She only described the number of children. Yeah, it's going to take ages till we get our food. He only talked about the time. Now let's look at other situations and think of how we could describe a relationship. What would be the relationship between the number of friends you have at your party and the size of each piece of cake? The more friends you have at your party, the smaller the piece of cake you get. Excellent. How about the relationship between the amount of traffic and the time it takes to go somewhere? Well, the 
more traffic, it, the longer it takes. You're getting the hang of this, aren't you? But all the ones we've done so far have just been about easy, everyday things. How will I know what the relationship is when I'm doing science? When you're doing the test question, you have to look for some results from an investigation in the question. Then you use the results to help you spot the relationship. But what will the results look like? Well, they could be in tables like this. Sometimes the tables also have pictures like this. Bar charts like this. Or line graphs like this. A line graph tells you a story about what's happening. In fact, we could have a go at sketching a line to represent the playground relationship we just looked at. When the children were spilling onto the playground, one of the factors we were interested in was the number of children. That's going to go on the horizontal axis, this bottom line, on our graph. Now, this line starts here with no children. The more the number of children increases, the further you go along the line. The other factor we're interested in, the loudness of the noise, goes on the other axis, the one going up vertically. This axis shows no noise here, but the louder the noise gets, the higher up on the line you go. And now we can draw a line to show the relationship. We start the line here because when there are no children, there's no noise. But as the number of children increases, so does the loudness of the noise. So the line goes up like this. That line went up from left to right. Do all line graphs go up like that? That's an interesting question. Now, have a look at this one. What we're interested in here is the amount of food eaten and the amount of food left on the plate. So here are the axes. When no food has been eaten, there's lots of food on the plate. So this time, the line starts here. The more food that gets eaten, the less is left on the plate. So to tell that story, the line must come down like this. I get it. Those lines are telling you a story. They tell you about the relationship. Well done. Now let's have a look at a test question which shows relationships in a different way. Some children carried out a fair test. They used three identical jars with 100 centimetre cubed of water in each jar. They put each jar in a different room. Each room was at a different temperature. They measured the volume of the water in each jar after one week. Here's the bar chart that shows the results. Now, what do you think is the relationship or the link between the temperature of the room and the volume of water left? The coldest room has the most water left. Mm, well, you found a bit of the relationship there, but you haven't really told the whole story. But what I said was right. Look, if you look at the bar chart, you can see that the coldest room had the most water left. Yes, but your comment was only about one result, the first column on the bar chart. You haven't said anything about the other two columns. How could you describe the relationship so that it covers all of your bar chart and not just that one result? OK, let me see. The first column is telling me that when the room was 14 degrees Celsius, there was 80 centimetre cubed of water left. When the room was 18 degrees Celsius, there was 60 centimetre cubed of water left. And when the room was 23 degrees Celsius, there was 40 centimetre cubed of water left in the jar. So, I know, the warmer the room, the less water is left in the jar. Excellent. Well done. That's it. The warmer the room, the less water left in the jar is the right way of describing the relationship between the temperature of the room and the amount of water left. Now, some of you might have thought of another relationship between the temperature of the room and the water left in the jar. The other way of saying the same thing is that the colder the room, the more water is left in the jar. If colder rooms leave more water, then warmer rooms leave less. Now, I understand what describing a relationship is, but how do I know when they want me to do it? Well, that's very simple. 
There's an easy way to spot a finding a relationship type of question. They nearly always have one of these two words in the question. Affects or depends. Do you remember the everyday relationships we looked at? The more children in the playground, the louder the noise. If someone wanted to ask you to describe that relationship, they would probably say something like this. Describe how the number of children in the playground affects the volume of noise. And you would reply? The more children in the playground, the louder the noise. Let's see some examples of this type of question in the test papers. Describe how the size of the force affects the length of the spring in the force meter. How does the time taken for the mixture to dry depend on the temperature of the radiator? Describe how the amount of mould which grows depends on the temperature. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's something else to spot in the way they ask you to describe relationships. They give you the two things you have to relate together in their sentence. Look at this one. Describe how the amount of mould which grows depends on the temperature. They want you to describe the relationship between the amount of mould and the temperature. And in this one, Describe how the size of the force affects the length of the spring in the force meter. They want you to find a relationship between the size of the force and the length of the spring. You see, in fact, they give you all the help they can for you to do your best. Yeah, you're right. In fact, I think I've noticed something else about how I should answer. I shouldn't use words like most or best or words that end in est. Instead, I should use words like more or words that end in er. OK, I think you're right, but tell me a bit more. Well, I shouldn't say, when there are most children in the playground, the noise is loudest. Instead, I should say, the more children in the playground, the louder the noise. Well, I think you've got it. Now, I bet you can do that question in your test with no problem at all now. Well, I'll try. Describe how changing the length of the wire in the circuit affects the brightness of the light. Right, it's got that word affects in it, so I know it's asking me to describe a relationship. Now, a relationship needs two things. Let's see if I can spot the two things that it's asking me to relate together. Right, it's the length of the wire and the brightness of the light. And is there some evidence to help you work it out? Yep. There's a table just above it. Now, the length of the wire goes from 40 metres down to 1 metre. And the brightness of the light goes from no light at all to very bright light. So, the relationship is, the shorter the wire, the brighter the light. Done it. Well, hang on. Haven't you forgotten something important? What? You need to write the answer down or nobody knows you've done it. Right. There you go. You're going to get full marks for that answer. Now, it wasn't that difficult after all, was it? No, it wasn't. That's the end of our programme about interpreting results in science test questions. So let's check what we've done. We saw that there are many questions in the test papers that ask about describing a relationship between two things. We looked at interpreting line graphs and bar graphs and we spotted the kind of questions that ask you to describe relationships. You and your teacher can go over these things at school and don't forget you can always wind the tape back and look at bits of the programme again. There are also our books, audio tapes and interactive Revise Wise website to help you prepare for your test. So, we'll let you get on with your test and we'll let you get on with your revision.
The next program is about living things. programs and in our books, audio tapes and on the internet, we're helping you with your Key Stage 2 science tests. In the test papers, questions on the different parts of science are all mixed up, so you could have a question about plants, followed by a question about forces, and then one about materials. But in each of these programs, we're going to concentrate on one part of science at a time. So let's make a start with living things in their environment. Here's a question about animals. They're living things. The owl has caught a mouse to feed its young. The owl has good hearing for finding its prey at night. Look at the picture. How else is the owl suited to catching its prey? So if I said owls had feathers, would that be right? Well, the owl does have feathers, but you're not really answering the question. Look at the question again. It says, how is the owl suited to catching its prey? And they've written catching in big, bold, black letters to try and draw your attention to it. So they're trying to help you. Now think about what the owl has that actually helps it to catch its food more easily. And remember that your answer has to be scientific. So, if I said it had good eyesight and very sharp and strong claws, would that be okay? Yes, because now you're answering the question that was asked. We say that the owl is adapted for catching its food because it has good eyesight, strong, sharp claws, and good hearing. Now, what's next? Which three things do all animals do? Tick three boxes. Move, play, wash, grow walk, reproduce. Well, my dog plays with me sometimes. Do you know, I think it would be useful if we reminded ourselves what living things are to work out what they can do. There are millions of different kinds of living things on the Earth. They can be found in many different places, from the cold of the Antarctic to the heat of a tropical jungle, from the deepest oceans to the driest deserts. The place that things live in is called their habitat. In order to survive, all living things need food, water, some kind of shelter, a suitable temperature, and to avoid being eaten by something else. Living things can be very, very small, such as bacteria and other microorganisms. Other things which are included as microorganisms are bigger. We know them as fungi, which we often see as mushrooms and toadstools. Then there are lots of different kinds of plants. Small ones, such as these daisies, and very large ones like these trees. The giant redwoods found in California can be up to 100 metres high, and the trunk can be 10 metres in diameter. There are so many kinds of animals. Worms, snails, crabs, insects, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. The interesting thing is that, despite the enormous variety, all living things need to do certain things to stay alive. Each kind of living thing does these in different ways, but we know that they feed, grow, get rid of waste, reproduce, move, and respond to changes in their environment. You said that all living things feed, but I thought plants make their own food. That's right. The main difference between plants and animals is that green plants make their own food, but animals have to eat. Yeah. I think I remember doing something about, um, you know, uh, food, food chains. Different animals eat different things. 
You can start with any animal and follow back what it ate. This is called the food chain. It tells us the lion eats a wildebeest. The wildebeest eats grass. So every living thing on Earth depends on plants. Plants make their own food, so they are always first in the food chain. They are called the producers. Everything else in the food chain eats plants or animals to survive. They are called the consumers. Let's see an example. The rabbit eats grass. But in nature, there are animals that eat rabbits, like this fox. So what do you think is the food chain there? So plants always come first, so grass is food for the rabbit, and the rabbit is food for the fox. Exactly. When you write a food chain, you have to write an arrow instead of saying, is food for. So here we have the producer, the grass, is food for, the rabbit, a consumer, and the rabbit is food for, another consumer, the fox. Look, I have a question about food chains. Yep, that's a good example of the kind of question you might get in the test. Now it says, caddisfly larva eats young tadpoles, young tadpole eats green plants, and great diving beetle larva eats young tadpoles. And then it says, write the names of three living things to show one food chain in this pond. OK, so I have to start with the producer, the green plant. So the green plant is food for the young tadpole, a consumer, and the young tadpole is food for the caddisfly larva and the great diving beetle. So I can choose any of them. Yep, exactly. Now write it down, otherwise you won't get the marks. Excellent. Right. Let's get on with the next part of the question. Right. Write on the table the names of one predator, one prey and one producer shown in these pictures. Well, I know about the producer. That's the green plant. But what about the prey and the predator? Well, a prey is an animal which is eaten by another animal. So here it will be the tadpole. And a predator eats another animal. So here it would be the caddisfly larvae or the great diving beetle larvae. Some animals can be prey and predator at the same time, like some birds. They can eat animals like snails and they can get eaten by other animals like cats or even bigger birds. Different kinds of animals and plants live in different places, different habitats, and they're adapted to the environment they live in. The cactus, for example, lives in hot desert. Its leaves have shrunken to spines so that it doesn't lose water. Other living things are adapted in other ways. This is starting to make some sense. We have different kinds of animals and plants living in different kinds of places, their habitat. And they can do that because they have become adapted to that environment. Yes. And it's because animals and plants have different features that we can group them and identify the different kinds. And to do that, we use a key. Supposing you met somebody from another planet, like XP from The Experimenter. My name's XP. Hello. Uh, I wonder if you can help me. Yes, certainly. Well, this says it's a key. Well, what does it um, sort of, you know, do? Well, this chart has a series of questions. By asking these questions, we can sort out what things are and identify them. I wonder if you can help me uh, find out what certainly. this is. Uh-huh. Right, I'll ask the questions you ask and the you question. say yes or no. Right. First of all, does it have four legs? Yes. Does it have a long tail? Hmm. No. Does it have stripy fur? No. Does it have spines? Yes. Well, let's see what the answer is. It is 
A hedgehog. It's a hedgehog. That's a hedgehog. That's right. <laughs> That's very clever. XP went on to collect mini beasts with some children. We found all of these creatures. Now, can anyone think of a way of sorting them out? We could count their legs, that's right. Some have got six and some have got lots and some haven't got any at all. Can anyone think of another way? Some slide. Some slide along like the worms and the slugs. So we could make a key. Keys can be made or keys can be used. When you make a key, you have to find out the characteristics that could divide a group of things into smaller and smaller groups until you're left with groups of only one thing. We can make keys for anything, and once they're done, they're very useful for identifying all sorts of things. You could try to make a key to help a visitor identify every single pupil in your class, for example. Yes. So what's the next question going to be? Do you have curly hair? So, by answering yes or no to descriptions like boy, curly hair, or fair skin, you can identify each pupil in a group. Chris, Nathan, Liam, Albana, Shirazid, Samira. OK, well, we've talked about a lot of stuff there, but let's go back to the first question. Which three things do all animals do? Move, play, wash, grow, walk, and reproduce. Well, that's easy. It's move, grow, and reproduce. Take the boxes then. Get yourself the marks. That's the end of our unit about living things. So what do we have to remember? Deciding what is the essential information to remember is very important when you learn anything, especially when you know you're going to have a test. My way of remembering things is to write down the key words I want to remember, thinking of the links between them. And I call it my memory bank. So today we talked about living things. All living things have things in common. They can feed or make their own food, grow, reproduce, move, get rid of waste, and respond to change in their environment. We can group living things together because they share the same features. The major groups that you need to know are plants, animals, and microorganisms. Living things are all part of a food chain. A food chain always starts with the green plants, the producers. The producers are food to some animals, the consumers, who in turn can be food to other animals. All animals are consumers. They cannot produce their own food. A predator is any animal that eats another animal. So any animal in this group is a predator, and in this group is a predator. A prey is an animal eaten by another animal. So, any animal in this group is a prey, and in this group is a prey. Some animals are both predators and prey, like some birds, for example. They eat animals like snails, but can also be food to other animals, like bigger birds or cats. Living things live in different habitats, like ponds, grasslands, deserts. They're adapted to their habitat. And remember, living things have different characteristics that can be used to make a key in order to group, classify or identify them. Now you and your teacher can go over some of these things at school. Don't forget, you can always wind the tape back and look at bits of the programme again. There are also our books, audio tapes and interactive RevisWise website to help you make the most of what you know when you're preparing for your test. The next programme is about humans and other animals, part one.
programmes and in our books, audio tapes and on the internet, we're helping you with your Key Stage 2 science tests. This time we're looking at humans and other animals. Can you find us a question about humans or other animals? Yep, here's one. Most human babies are born without teeth. Why do babies not need teeth? Well, that's easy, because they're too young to have teeth. Hang on. You need to answer the question more carefully, and you need to make sure you answer the question that's asked. Now, what does the question say? It says, why do babies not need teeth? And what did you say? Because they're too young to have teeth. But there are lots of things that babies are too young to have or can't do because they're too young. You need to answer the question and be precise and scientific. How? Well, think about what we have teeth for. We have different kinds of teeth, incisors, canines and molars. Incisors are sharp. They're there to cut, bite and tear food off. Canines are pointed also to help tear food. Molars are large and flat. They grind and chew. When babies are born, they have no teeth and feed on milk and soft food. Then, as they get their teeth, they can now eat lots of different things because they can chew, crush and tear their food. Humans have two sets of teeth during their lives. Children lose their milk teeth from around 6 to 12 years old and get adult teeth. If you don't brush your teeth regularly, bacteria that eat all the bits of food left there multiply and cause decay. Other animals have teeth that look different from ours. Tigers have big canine teeth. They use them for tearing meat. Horses eat grass, hay, grain and other plant-based food that needs to be ground up rather than torn apart. So their teeth have flat bearing surfaces. Humans have a mixture of cutting teeth and grinding teeth because we eat a mixed diet. So does a chimpanzee. If you know a really friendly dog or cat, look at their teeth. Do they look more like a tiger or more like a horse? What does this tell you about the food they prefer to eat? Now, did that help you to answer the question? Yes. I have to answer the question in a scientific way. And the scientific point about teeth is that they are used to eat solid food. Yeah. And so, the answer is that babies don't need teeth because they only have milk and mashed up food. So, they don't need to chew. Exactly. So, that's what you write down. Now, have you noticed that this question about human babies has several parts to it? A lot of questions on the science paper are like that. So to get more marks, make sure you've answered all the parts. It's not just babies' teeth that grow and develop as they get older. Do you remember when you were a baby? How do you think you've changed since then? How do you think you will change in the future? When we're born, we're able to breathe, feed, and detect things around us, but as we grow, we don't just get bigger, we change as well. For example, we grow hair on our heads and later on other parts of our bodies. We get our first teeth, which are then replaced by adult teeth. Our bodies change as our muscles develop. Many of the major changes happen between the ages of 10 and 14, which is the part of our life called adolescence. This is the time when boys' voices break and they start to grow facial hair. Girls' bodies change and their menstrual cycles start. We are then adults. When we become adults, our bodies stay very much the same until we start to get old. And then we can see changes, for example to our skin that becomes more wrinkled, and our bones which may become weaker. We go 
through different stages as we grow up. Baby, child, adolescent, adult. This is called the human life cycle. And it all starts when we are born. Well, no, not exactly. Actually, it starts before we're born with fertilization. Fertilization in humans begins with the joining of two special cells. The cell produced by its mother is called the egg, and the sperm cell is produced by its father. The joining of the egg and sperm is fertilization. The egg and sperm contain special parts called genes. The genes carry information on how to make the baby. The fertilized egg divides over and over again to form new cells. Later on, these cells grow into different parts of the body. Fertilization takes place in a special tube inside the mother called the fallopian tube. About three days after fertilization, the fertilized egg travels out of the fallopian tube into an organ nearby called the womb. Here, it burrows into the lining of the womb and begins to develop into a baby. Almost six weeks after fertilization, the baby's heart is beating. The head, body and eyes are also forming. By the ninth week, the baby can move and its hands and feet are clearly formed. During the next 30 weeks, the baby continues to grow until it's ready to be born. When we're looking after babies, one of the important things is to make sure everything is kept clean to protect them from catching diseases. When babies are born, they have no natural defences against diseases, so we have to be very careful when we're looking after them, especially when getting their milk or food ready. It's important to try to make sure that harmful germs, called microbes or microorganisms, don't get into the baby's bodies, so we need to sterilise their bottles to kill off the microbes. As babies get older, they build up a resistance to many of the microbes, so they don't make them ill anymore. There are some diseases, however, that babies need particular protection against, so they're given injections to prevent them from catching such diseases. You know, even when we get older, we must still be careful to avoid spreading microbes and diseases. That's why we should cover our nose and mouth when we sneeze, especially when we have a cold. Is that why we make sure we wash our hands after we've been to the toilet? That's right. my scientific investigation. It's 2 p.m. in the afternoon and I haven't washed my hands all day. I'm visiting a hospital laboratory where I can find out just what's lurking on my hands. Are my hands really a germ zone? Andrew, hello. Oh, better not, Trish. Oh, yeah, I forgot. When are we going to start this investigation? I want to wash my hands. Well, it's... Andrew Stacey is a microbiologist who can help me to find out just how germy my hands really are. So it's germs that we're looking for today, isn't it? Well, germs isn't a very scientific word. A better word is microbe. Microbe? Yes, these are small forms of life which are too small to be seen by the naked eye, but we can see them under the microscope. I'm just going to rub this swab over the, your hand and we'll pick up some microbes which we can then demonstrate. Okay. Okay, that's all finished. So that's it? That's it now. Oh, great. I can wash my hands. While I wash my hands and everything I've touched, Andrew prepares microscope slides using the samples he's taken from my hands. Microbes are all very small but there are a whole range of different sorts of microbes. These are all one particular group called bacteria. We're seeing them magnified 1,000 times. There are different types of bacteria too. 
These pale pink rod shaped bacteria are called bacilli. And guess where they came from? <laughs> this sample contains bacteria called streptococci, which usually live up your nose. Andrew, all that living on my hands. Yes, Trish, but don't worry. Even clean hands have millions of microbes on them, and they're not all harmful. And of course, the hands aren't the only place where microbes live. Let me show you. Open wide. Okay. <coughs> All these bacteria live harmlessly down a normal, healthy throat, or so Andrew assured me. But this is a sample from a sore throat. Bacteria which may be harmless on your hands can cause infection in your throat, so you should always wash before eating. <coughs> So next time you see a sign like this, don't just think about it, do it. In the test, there are often questions about how we can stop diseases from spreading. Here's one. It says, children made a poster about things that can prevent disease. Complete the poster below by writing two correct phrases from the list. Washing hands, not smoking, taking exercise, sneezing into your handkerchief, eating less sugar. Well, there's the poster with one part already done, with not smoking written in it. So you need to find two other answers. Well, we've just seen, if you don't wash your hands, microbes living on them can cause diseases. OK, so where do you put it? It'll be this one, to reduce the risk of food poisoning, because people might be touching food with their dirty hands. That's absolutely right. So what goes in the one about reducing the spread of colds and flu? It will be sneezing into your handkerchief because that will stop your flu germs from spreading to anyone else. Excellent. Now write them down. Right. So now it's time to check what keywords we've got to put in the memory bank. Humans are part of the animal kingdom. Humans have teeth, incisors for cutting, canines for stabbing, and molars for chewing and grinding. The human life cycle starts with the sperm fertilizing the egg. The fertilised egg develops in the woman's womb and becomes a baby. The baby is born and grows into a child. The child becomes an adolescent, who becomes an adult, who in turn produces sperm or eggs. And don't forget, to stay in good health, you have to keep yourself and your environment germ-free. Now you and your teacher can go over some of these things at school. Don't forget you can always wind the tape back and look at bits of the programme again. There are also our books, audio tapes and interactive RevisWise website to help you make the most of what you know when you're preparing for your test. The next program is about humans and other animals, part two. In these programmes and in our books, audio tapes and on the internet, we're helping you with your Key Stage 2 science tests. This time we're looking further at humans and other animals. Which of these could lead to a greater chance of heart disease? Tick two boxes. Regular exercise. Smoking. Eating lots of fruits and vegetables. Eating lots of fatty foods not washing regularly. So what seems to be the problem? 
I don't remember doing heart diseases in class. I mean, we measured our pulse rate, but how is this linked with the heart? We talked about the breath going faster when we run. Oh, no. I could hear my heart. It's beating really quickly. Don't panic. Don't panic. Your heart is beating quickly because you're nervous. What you need to do is calm down, take some deep breaths. Your heart and your lungs will work all day, 24 hours a day, to keep you alive. There are lots of questions in the test papers about the human body. This one asked, what will lead to a greater chance of heart disease? Let's think about it in another way. What would you say our bodies need to stay alive? Well, I suppose we need food and air, I mean oxygen. What do you think we need them for? So we can run about and grow. But what's that got to do with the heart? Let me explain. The body has a number of different systems. There's a system for dealing with our food, the digestive system. Then there's a system for getting air into our bodies. When we breathe, our lungs fill with air. Our bodies need a gas called oxygen in the air to stay alive. If there's no air to breathe, we need to supply our lungs with oxygen. Underwater, this scuba diver has cylinders of compressed air on her back. In space, an astronaut needs breathing equipment too. Breathing is an essential process of human beings. The heart is a pump which propels blood around the body. The blood is pumped to the organs through delivery tubes called arteries and veins. As the heart beats, it pumps the blood to the liver, to the kidneys, to the legs, and the rest of the body. The human heart beats about 70 to 80 times a minute. Leandra's heart rate is about 70. But different animals have different heart rates. A small animal's heart beats much faster. This budgie's heart rate is about 750 times a minute. And a huge python has a heart rate of only 14 beats per minute. The blood carries oxygen around the body. When the blood leaves the heart, it carries a lot of oxygen. The organs use the oxygen, so when the blood returns to the heart in the veins, it contains much less oxygen. So the blood travels to the lungs, where it collects oxygen from the air that we breathe. It then travels back to the heart, so the cycle can start all over again. And when we move about, all of this is still going on. And when we run, we need more oxygen and food so our muscles can work harder. So we're breathing quicker and our hearts need to beat faster to keep up. So what if I'm out of breath? Well, when you're out of breath, your body is telling you to stop for a bit because it can't keep up. But whatever activity you've been doing, whether it's running or walking, once you've been resting for long enough, your heart rate will be back to normal, which is around 72 beats a minute. Oh, I get it now. Now, your heart and your lungs are vital to staying alive, but there are other parts of your body which are also very important, like the skeleton. The skeleton supports a person's body. It holds it up. It also protects what is inside the body, keeping it from being hurt. As humans grow, their skeleton grows with them. This is the same for all animals that have their skeleton on the inside. But did you ever wonder how we managed to move? Well, have a look at this. Looking inside a running knee joint, the muscles that cause movement are attached to bones. They're called skeletal muscles. So it's skeletal muscles that move your body, and they work in pairs. Now you can feel two of these working together when you bend and straighten your arm. You can see it with this model. To bend your arm, the biceps contracts. It gets shorter. You can see it bulge and harden. The triceps relaxes. As a result, the biceps pulls the bones together and the arm bends. 
to straighten your arm, the opposite happens. The triceps contracts and the biceps relaxes. This pulls the bones straight. Muscles can only contract and pull bones, never push them. So you can see how the skeleton and the muscles work together to help us move. Your body is like a machine with all these systems working together and as with every machine it needs to be kept in good order to work properly. So it's very important to exercise your body and to keep fit. But there are other things you have to do to take care of your body. Everyone gets ill sometimes, even athletes. If you get ill with something like a cold, flu or asthma, there are all sorts of drugs and medicines that you can take to help you get better. Most athletes eat healthy diets and train long and hard to get fit and healthy. But there are some people who take shortcuts to fitness. Drugs used to treat illness are sometimes taken by athletes who aren't ill, but think the drugs will make them faster and stronger. Although taking drugs may seem at first to help them, after a while these athletes may damage their hearts, livers and other organs, or even die. The sporting authorities don't allow athletes to take drugs without permission from a doctor. If athletes ignore these rules and are caught, they're banned from competing. But are medicines and drugs the same thing? Well, yes and no. Medicines are drugs which are designed to help you get better. Some people with asthma, like me for example, will always need an inhaler. But if you're not ill, medicine can be dangerous. That's why you should only take medicine which has been prescribed by your doctor. Even aspirin and paracetamol can be dangerous if you take too many of them. Cigarettes can also be harmful to your body. And there are often questions in the test paper about the effects that smoking and drugs have on the human body. The work of the lungs, together with the heart and the blood vessels, is to carry oxygen from the air to the body. Oxygen is a gas that makes up about a fifth of the air that we breathe. It releases the energy which the body needs to stay alive. Many things can harm healthy lungs, such as smoking cigarettes. The tobacco smoke from cigarettes contain poisonous chemicals such as nicotine and carbon monoxide and a sticky substance called tar. This smoking machine has a filter which shows the build-up of tar after just a few cigarettes. The tar is sticky and heavy, so it stays in the lungs where it clogs up the tubes. The carbon monoxide passes through the lungs into the blood, where it takes up valuable room that's needed for oxygen. If the lungs continue to inhale tobacco smoke, they eventually become damaged. When this happens, breathing becomes difficult. The clean, healthy lungs on the left belong to a non-smoker. The lungs on the right belong to someone who smokes. The dark pink patches show he has lung cancer. And we know that a major cause of lung cancer is smoking. And because there is carbon monoxide in the blood when someone smokes, their heart has to work harder to supply the level of oxygen they need. That can tire it and can lead to heart diseases. So what could I do to keep my body in good condition? Well, let's have a look. Training and exercise are an important part of a healthy lifestyle. But so is food and what you eat. Think of your body like a car. If you put petrol in a car, it will go. But if you put the wrong type of petrol in a car, it will start to go wrong. 60% of what you eat should be carbohydrates. This will give you energy and are foods like potatoes, rice and pasta. You also need protein, which will make you grow strong and healthy. And these are foods like seafood, meat and lentils. And finally, for pudding, I avoid sugary, fatty things like chocolate and cream cakes, and I go for fruit. A little question. Why do you think Amanda avoids sugars and fatty foods? Hmm. Well, let's see if our science team can help. We should avoid fatty foods because they can cause veins and arteries to get blocked, and that is not good for the heart. Too much sugar can lead to tooth decay. We need to eat a balanced diet. So, now, do you think you can answer the question in your test paper? Yeah, no problem. And I have to tick the boxes next to the things that could lead to a greater chance of heart disease. It's not regular exercise, because that's good for you. And it's not eating lots of fruits and vegetables, because that too is very good for you. 
And it's not not washing regularly because that makes you smelly, but that has nothing to do with the matter. And it's smoking and eating lots of fatty foods. And why do you think that? Eating lots of fatty food can clog up your veins and your arteries, making your heart work harder. And smoking, because when you smoke, carbon monoxide gets into your blood, so your heart has to work even harder to supply the same level of oxygen to your body. So that means they both make the heart work harder, so it gets too tired and it gets diseases. That's exactly right. Now make sure you tick the boxes. Right. So now it's time to check what keywords we've got to put in the memory bank. Humans are part of the animal kingdom. Humans have a heart, two lungs, some muscles and a skeleton. The heart is a pump. It pumps blood around the body through arteries and veins. Arteries carry the blood away from the heart and to the body parts. Veins carry blood back to the heart. Blood from the heart goes to the lungs to pick up oxygen, which gets pumped around the body. At the same time, the blood picks up carbon dioxide and takes it back to the heart and then to the lungs to get rid of it. Blood also carries digested food around the body. Food provides us with energy. Energy is needed for growth and for movement. The skeleton and muscles help us to move. The muscles work in pairs. They contract and relax. The skeleton also supports the body and protects the internal organs. For humans to stay healthy, we should exercise, have a balanced diet, avoid harmful drugs, and avoid smoking. You and your teacher can go over these things at school and don't forget you can always wind the tape back and look at bits of the programme again. There are also our books, audio tapes and interactive Revise Wise website to help you prepare for your test. So, we'll let you get on with your test and we'll let you get on with your revision. The next programme is about green plants. In these programmes and in our books, audio tapes and on the internet, we're helping you with your Key Stage 2 science tests. This time we're looking at green plants. I've got a question here about plants and I don't understand it at all. It's got this sort of drawing thing of plants and then it says, Children planted a seed of a fast growing plant. How tall did the plant grow above soil in 28 days? How am I supposed to know that? I've never done this experiment before. Well, you're right. You didn't do the experiment, so they must have given you a graph or a table with some results. Hmm. Well, I can't see a table here. But you're right, it's got a kind of a graph. So what's the problem? I can't figure out how to read it. Well, here they've used pictures to show what has happened, but you read it like a bar graph. You look at the horizontal axis first, it tells you the time in days, so you have to look at the time you're interested in. Here it's 28 days. Then you look on the vertical axis, which shows the plant's height above the soil in centimetres. The plant is 20 centimetres high. OK, I've got it now. It's quite simple, really. Great. So what's the next part of the question? 
How many days did the complete cycle of the plant take? I don't know what the cycle of a plant is. Have a look at this. Every flowering plant begins as a seed. The seed germinates, grows roots and a stem, then leaves appear, and later on flowers. The flowers get pollinated and produce fruit. The fruit contains seeds ready to be dispersed to make another plant. Can we go through that more slowly? Yes. Do you remember planting seeds and getting them to grow? Yes. Well, the first thing that happens is that the seeds germinate. They start to grow a root and a stem. The science team wanted to find out what conditions seeds need to do this. We did this experiment to find out what was necessary for seeds to germinate. We wanted to find out if seeds needed light, soil, warmth and water. So we tried to germinate lots of different seeds in lots of different ways. This is cotton wool. is soil. We found out that seeds didn't need light, they can germinate in the dark. Seeds do not need soil, they can germinate in cotton wool. Seeds need water but not too much to germinate. The seeds without water never germinated and the seeds with too much water never germinated either. All the seeds we tried liked the warmth. The thing to remember is that all seeds need water to germinate, but not too much, and that seeds are sensitive to temperature. The ones the science team tried liked warmth, but some, like the ones of plants living in the Arctic, can germinate in pretty cold temperatures. Seeds need the right temperature to germinate, and for different seeds, that temperature can be different. I'm a bit surprised by that. I thought plants needed light. You're right. Plants need light, but not seeds. Seeds can germinate without light. When you put seeds in the soil, it's dark, but they still germinate. Of course you're right. Seeds don't need light, but plants do. Do plants need lots of light? Well, that's what Sarah from the experimenter was trying to find out. She wanted to know if plants needed light or water, and how much. It was time for me to finish my experiment before any of the plants died. Okay. So off I went to record the final results. Right. The bright light plant is scorched. The plant that had no light at all has gone all pale. The plant that had some light is healthy. Okay, let's check the water experiment. The normal watering plant is healthy. plant that had no water at all is yeah, crispy. The plant that had lots of water has gone curly. Mm. I should really do the experiment again to see if all the results are the same the second time round. But I can do that another day. All I know is that this plant needs some, but not too much water, and some, but not too much light. Hmm. Know how I can rescue my plant now. What about soil? Do plants need soil to grow? Well, not exactly. Plants need nutrients, not soil. They need the nutrients or minerals that are in the soil. It helps them grow healthily. They also like soil because their roots can anchor themselves strongly, but they don't need the soil. Now, once the plant is big enough, it starts to produce flowers. Do you know why? 
to make new seeds. Yep, you're right. Plants produce flowers which have male and female organs. Now, the male part of the plant is the stamen, and this top bit here is called the anther, and then this bit here is called the filament. Now, the female part of the plant is called the carpal. Now, the bit at the top is called the stigma, and then the middle bit is the style, and then down here, this bit is called the ovary, and inside the ovary is the ovule. Seeds are formed when the pollen from the anthers fertilizes the ovule. Now, to do this, the pollen has to be transported by the wind or insects like bees. Now, coming from the anther, it's received by the usually sticky stigma at the top of the carpal and it then moves from the stigma to the ovary where it fertilizes the ovule. Now, most of the time, flowers need to receive pollen not from their own anthers, but from another flower of the same type. So insects are very important for the fertilization to take place, and petals are often very colorful to attract them. Once the ovule has been fertilized, seeds develop and a fruit starts to form. Seeds have to be dispersed away from the parent plant to avoid having to compete with it for water, light, and nutrients. Different seeds have different ways of being dispersed. Some are dispersed by the wind, others by water, and others by animals. Each seed's shape is appropriate to its mode of dispersion. In the test, they often ask you to name the different parts of the flower. So make sure that you remember petals, the male part of the plant, the stamen, with its anther, and filament, the female part of the plant, the carpal with its stigma, style, ovary, and ovule. And what do the petals, the anther, and the stigma do? I know this. The petals color attract insects, the anther makes pollen, and the stigma receives pollen. Excellent. Let's remind ourselves what other parts of the plant do. There are many thousand different types of plant in the world, from little grasses to enormous trees. But all flowering plants have a few things in common. They use light energy and gases from the air to make more plant. These will show you what all plants share. Leaves take in air and light from the sun. Sometimes they help protect the plants from animals. These holly leaves have sharp prickles to stop animals from eating them. Roots anchor the plant to the ground and allow it to take up water. They grow downwards searching for water and nutrients. The stem is full of water and holds the plant up like a human backbone. The biggest and strongest stems are the trunks of trees. All plants like to grow in soil because the soil contains small amounts of substances called minerals that help keep the plant healthy. Plants make their own food and build their own plant bodies. They make their leaves, stems, roots and flowers using water, gases from the air and sunlight. That's the very special thing about plants. They use light energy from the sun, 
the gas carbon dioxide from the air and water to make their own food. Only plants do that. Everything else has to eat plants or other animals to survive. But my mum buys plant food. No, she doesn't. It's called plant food in shops, but it's not really. It's nutrients. Now, nutrients are very important to keep the plants healthy, but they're not food. So plants are very important if they're the only ones that make their own food. I mean, we have to eat plants or animals who eat plants to survive. Yeah, you're right. But let's answer that test question. OK. So how many days did the complete cycle of the plant take? Well, the plant cycle started with the seed and it took... ...31 days for that plant to produce the seed itself. Very good. And what about the next part of the question? The diagram above shows the stages in the life cycle of the plant, labelled A to G. Write the correct letter for each of the stages in the table. One has been done for you. Then it has a table which says pollination, fruits on plant, germination and seed dispersal. Well, they're saying that pollination is E. Well, we can see that because it has flowers on the plant and there's a bee buzzing around it. Germination is when the seed starts to grow a root and a stem, so that would be B. Seed dispersal, that would be G. Excellent. And the last part of the question? Explain what these parts do to help plants to grow well. Roots and leaves. Well, the roots anchor the plant and take in water and nutrients. And the leaves, taking carbon dioxide from the air, light energy from the sun, to produce food for the plant. Spot on. So now it's time to check what keywords we've got to put in the memory bank. Living things include plants. Plants have different parts. Leaves, roots, stems and flowers. And you have to remember what they do. Plants make their own food and to do so they need sunlight, carbon dioxide from the air and water. Food is used for growth during the life cycle of the plant. The plant life cycle starts with the seeds, which will germinate to produce new plants which will have flowers, which can be pollinated and produce new seeds. Flowers have petals, a male part, the stamen, which has an anther and a filament, a female part, the carpal, which has a stigma, a style, an ovary and an ovule. Now you can go over all this at school by winding the tape back and looking at bits of the programme again. There are also books, audio tapes and our RevisWise website to help you prepare for your test. The next programme is about materials and their properties. programs and in our books, audio tapes and on the internet, we're helping you with your Key Stage 2 science tests. This time we're looking at materials and their properties. Water in the pan is being heated. Some pans have metal handles which get hot. This plastic handle does not get as hot. Explain why the plastic handle does not get as hot as a metal handle. Well, I don't know, it just doesn't. I don't know what to say. Well, you've just got to think about materials and their properties. Suppose I asked you to describe a material like this metal spoon. Now, what sort of words might you use to describe it? Well, it's smooth and shiny. Well, those are two of this metal's properties, and there are lots of other properties too. You can ask yourself questions about a material to help you sort out its properties. 
Questions like, is it hard? Is it transparent? Is it stretchy? Is it flexible? Things like that. When we want to compare materials, we can do it according to their properties. In this film, two fabrics are being compared. Each fabric is made of a different material, and the materials are tested for different properties. In the Victorian times, mountaineers had to wear clothes made out of heavy woolen tweed and leather boots, entirely natural materials. Nowadays, mountaineers wear clothes made of Gore-Tex, a synthetic fibre, plastic boots and metal crampons. But how do the properties of woolen tweed compare with a modern synthetic fibre like Gore-Tex in the laboratory? Gore-Tex versus tweed. Strength test. This test pulls the fabric with a bigger and bigger force until it snaps. The tweed snaps at 265 newtons. The Gore-Tex snaps at 788 newtons, so the Gore-Tex fabric is much stronger than the tweed. A hundred square centimetres of Gore-Tex weighs 2.3 grams. The same area of tweed weighs 4.2 grams, almost twice as much. And what's more, if we check that weight again when wet, the Gore-Tex fabric is only slightly heavier but the woolen tweed weighs a lot more. Waterproofing. This test measures how waterproof the fabric is. The water pressure increases and increases. The tweed fails almost immediately, but the Gore-Tex withstands a water pressure 50 times higher until it bursts. It's totally waterproof. Windproofing. The wind whistles through the tweed. Look at the candle. But the Gore-Tex fabric is totally windproof, so you'd feel much warmer in the Gore-Tex. I see. Because the Gore-Tex is stronger, lighter, more windproof and waterproof than the tweed, it's better for climbing in the mountains. Properties are easy. Well, most of them are quite straightforward, but there are some that we need to look at in a little more detail. Have a look at these different materials. Well, there's sponge, plastic and... Four types of metal. Yeah. The foil is made of aluminium, the spoon is made of steel, the nail is made of iron, the 2p coin is made of copper. Now, we're going to test how good some materials are at conducting electricity. Sponge. No light. Plastic. No light. Iron. Light. Aluminium. Light. Steel. Light. Copper. Light. OK, so aluminium, copper, iron and steel conduct electricity, but sponge and plastic don't. So, all the metals we tested conduct electricity, but the plastic and the sponge don't conduct electricity. Now, let's do another test. Let's see which of those materials are attracted by this magnet. This is easy. I bet the sponge and the plastic won't be attracted, but all the metals will, just like they were all conductors of electricity. I don't need to do this test. I'm pretty sure I know the answer already. OK, then I'll check. 
copper, not attracted. Steel, attracted. Iron, attracted. Aluminium, not attracted. Plastic, not attracted. Sponge, not attracted. Okay, so all the metals we tested were conductors of electricity, but only iron and steel were attracted to the magnet. You've got it. All metals are electrical conductors, but not all of them are attracted to magnets. There's one other property we ought to look at, and that's thermal insulation. What's that? Well, to insulate means to keep apart, and thermal comes from heat, so it means to keep apart heat. I'll give you an example. Have you ever put a coat on when it's cold outside? Yes, because it keeps me warm. Well, we wear a coat because it's a good thermal insulator. The science team did an investigation. We did an experiment to show which material was the best insulator. We put the material onto the can. and put hot water into the can. They measured the temperature of the hot water in the can at the start of the experiment. 45. 45. It was 45 degrees. After the 50th minute, we measured it again. 35. 40. We made a bar graph. It shows that the fur was the best insulator because it had the less drop. This kept the water the hottest. If you're going to understand thermal insulators, you have to think about temperatures. Have a look at these pictures. Pick out the hotter thing and the colder thing in each one. So which is hotter, the hot drink or the air? The hot drink. Which is hotter, the air or the boy? The boy. Which is hotter, the snowman or the air? The air. Very good. The one thing you need to remember is that the hotter thing will always warm up the colder thing. Let's put an arrow on each picture to show that. Here, the heat goes from the hot drink to the air. Here, the heat goes from the boy to the air. Here, the heat goes from the air to the snowman. So the heat always goes from hotter to colder. And if you want to slow it down, what should you do? I don't know. Well, what do you do when you put your coat on? I cover myself. Yes. In this case, you are the hotter thing, and you put a material between you and the air, the colder thing. You make a sort of heat barrier. We call materials that make good heat barriers thermal insulators. Now think of some materials that are good thermal insulators which you could use in each of our pictures. I know, you could use a thicker material for the cup. You know, that polystyrene stuff. That would make a better barrier between the hot drink and the colder air. That would stop it from cooling down so quickly. You're right. Polystyrene is a material that's a good thermal insulator. What about the last two? 
Well, you could put a nice thick coat on the boy. That would make a good thermal insulator. And you could put one on the snowman as well. That would still make a good thermal insulator. That's interesting, isn't it? In the first case, the coat went on the boy to slow down the heat from the hotter boy going to the colder air. But with the snowman, the coat slowed down the heat from the hotter air going to the colder snowman. The coat is a good thermal insulator and slows down the flow of heat. Knowing about the properties of materials is really useful. It helps us to decide which materials we should use to do different jobs. For example, glass is transparent and a good thermal insulator, so it's good to use for windows. Metal conducts heat, so it's good to use for radiators. Some papers let some light through. They're good to use for lampshades. Plastic is good to use for drain pipes. It doesn't rust like metal. Toweling is water absorbent. It's good to use for towels. See how useful it is to know about properties of materials. Now, can you answer the question, why does the plastic handle not get as hot as the metal handle? Yeah, I think I can do the question now. So what's going to be your answer? The plastic handle does not get as hot because plastic is a better thermal insulator than metal. Great. Write it down. Now it's time for us to fill the memory bank and link together the key things we need to remember. Materials have properties like strength, hardness, flexibility, thermal insulation, and the ability to conduct electricity. All metals conduct electricity. Some metals are attracted to magnets. Some others are not attracted to magnets. Iron and steel are metals that are attracted to magnets. Aluminium and copper are not attracted to magnets. Now you can go over all this at school by winding the tape back and looking at bits of the programme again. There are also books, audio tapes and our Revise Wise website to help you prepare for your test. The next programme is about solids, liquids and gases. In these programmes, and in our books, audio tapes and on the internet, we're helping you with your Key Stage 2 science tests. This time, we're looking at solids, liquids and gases. Some children are learning about the water cycle. The different forms of water are solid, liquid and gas. Put one tick in each row of the table below to show whether each one is solid, liquid or gas. One has been done for you. Well, they've ticked liquid for rain. I could have done that one myself. I know that water is a liquid. But what about this water vapour and snow? I don't know whether that's a solid or a liquid. Well, let's get these solids, liquids and gases sorted out. I bet you know quite a lot about solids, liquids and gases. I bet you could point to a solid, a liquid and a gas right here in front of you. Well, that's easy. The bottle is the solid, the drink inside is the liquid, and the bubbles are the gas. Well, that was no problem. We'll come back to gases later. 
But first, can you sort this lot into solids and liquids? Well, these are hard and solid. These are definitely liquids, because they're runny and you can pour them. I think the treacle's a liquid, even though it's very sticky. But I'm not sure about the sand and the fur fabric. You see, the fur fabric's very soft, but I thought solids had to be hard. But it's not runny. Oh, I'll call it a solid. And the sand, this, you can pour this, but sure, it ought to be a liquid. But it's not wet. Oh, I don't know. Try looking at the sand through the magnifier. Oh, it looks like lots of little rocks. I think sand is a solid. Great. You got them all right, but you weren't always sure how to decide. What you need are some good ways to help you tell one from the other. Now try this. It's the changing shape test. Now put each material down on the plate, watch it for a bit, and see if it changes shape. All the solids stayed the same shape. And the liquids? Well, they spread out, even if the treacle does take ages. Does this mean that you can tell a solid from a liquid by the way they change their shapes? Liquids do and solids don't. That's it. Now, what about gases? I hate thinking about gases. You can't see them. How do you know that there really is anything there? Well, watch this. For my next experiment, I have a very special ingredient. flask of nothing. But watch this. It's a colourless, odourless, but heavy gas. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide gas may be invisible, but look, it casts a shadow. OK, that convinced me. Gases really exist. But are there any tests to tell a gas from a liquid or a solid? Good question. Yes, there are two tests you can do. The first one is the does it change volume test. Well, what do you mean? Well, does it always take up the same amount of space or could you squash it into a smaller space? Well, I know about solids. They'll always take up the same space. They can't change volume, but what about liquids and gases? Now look at these two syringes. Now one is full of air, a mixture of gases, and the other one is full of water, which is a liquid. Now take the water one, put your thumb over the end so that none can come out. Now try and squash the plunger down. Can you squash the water? Can you make it change volume? No. That's because liquids stay the same volume. Now try the gas one. Look, I can push it quite a lot. But the plunger won't go all the way down because the gas in there takes up some room. 
So that means the volume of a gas can change and the gas can also change shape. Now, the last test you can do is the does it flow easily test. Well, the solids won't flow, but the liquids will. But what about the gases? I can't see them, so I don't know if they can flow or not. Well, have a look at the shadow of the carbon dioxide once more. Oh, yes, of course. Gases can flow. OK, so there are three questions you can ask yourself to decide if something is a gas, a liquid, or a solid. Does it change shape? Does it change volume? Does it flow easily? If it's a solid, it won't change shape, it won't change volume, and it won't flow easily. If it's a liquid, it will change shape, it won't change volume, and it will flow easily. If it's a gas, it will change shape, change volume, and flow easily. Now what's this? A solid, a liquid, or a gas? Well, it changes shape, flows easily, doesn't change volume, it's a liquid. And is it always liquid, or could it turn into a solid? Well, I've never seen a solid shampoo. Hmm, funny you should mention that. The temperature of this cold room is at minus 30 degrees Celsius. I'm here to investigate how liquids like these cope with this chilly climate. These test tubes all contain different liquid toiletries, but after a spell at minus 30 degrees, are they still liquid? Aruna, the lab manager, helps me check them out. I think our big fridge has actually worked. Shampoo, deodorant, bath oil, bubble bath, liquid soap. All the toiletries have frozen solid. So those liquids could turn into a solid, but the only reason that I've never seen solid shampoo is because it's never been cold enough. Spot on. And most materials can change from a solid to a liquid to a gas and back again from a gas to a liquid to a solid. Hang on a minute. If that's right, you're telling me that a gas could become a liquid I don't believe that. You can't get liquid oxygen, can you? Well, watch this. Oxygen gas passes through this tube into a copper pipe. The bucket contains liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. Very cold indeed. After a few minutes of cooling, look at the end of the pipe. Drops of liquid. It's so cold that the oxygen gas passing through the tube becomes a liquid. In this tube, there's a solid, bromine. This is liquid bromine. And now, the tube is filling with brown gas. Bromine again. The same stuff, but in totally different forms. How come? Most materials can be solid, liquid and gas, but for a lot of materials it needs to be very hot or very cold for the changes to happen. But there's one very common substance which we often see making the changes at everyday temperatures. I know, water. That does all the changes, doesn't it? Yeah, water can become solid. And become liquid again. It can become water vapour. And still become liquid again. But it's not just water that can change into different forms. For example, wax can be liquid or solid.
chocolate can become liquid and so can metals at very high temperatures. If it's really cold, oil can become solid and oxygen can become liquid. In fact, most materials can change forms, but often they need very high or very low temperatures for their changes to take place, so we don't often see them happening. Now, each change or process we've been looking at has a name. When a solid turns into a liquid, we say that it is... Melting. Great. And when a liquid turns into a gas, we say that it is... Evaporating. I know these ones, but I don't know the words for when the opposite happens. Well, when a gas turns into a liquid, we say that it is condensing. And when a liquid turns into a solid, we say that it is freezing or solidifying. And the important thing to remember about these changes is that the material is the same stuff. Take water. It can be solid, that's what we call ice or snow. Liquid, that's the stuff we drink and wash with. Or gas, that's what we call water vapour. But each one is water, just in a different form. So one little bit of water could be freezing, melting, evaporating, condensing, freezing, melting, on and on and on. And as we will always have the same stuff, we call these changes reversible. Right, I think I'm sorted now. Let's get back to that question. So we said that water vapour is a gas, snow is a solid and ice is a solid. Easy. Great. Fill it in then. So now it's time to check what keywords we've got to put in the memory bank. Materials can be in three states, solid, liquid and gas. A solid melts to become a liquid. A liquid evaporates to become gas. A gas condenses to become liquid. A liquid freezes or solidifies to become solid. These changes can happen again and again. No new materials are made, they are reversible. You can go over all this at school by winding the tape back and looking at bits of the programme again. There are also books, audio tapes and our RevisWise website to help you prepare for your test.